The broadcast is now starting. All attendees are in listen-only mode. Good morning. I'm Carly Rogers, CAPSA's Marketing and Education Manager. Welcome to our e-training webinar, Energizing Your World with Electroplating, sponsored by Ameriplate Incorporated. This presentation will help increase your abilities, enhance your efficiency, and assist in providing quality to your customers. Before I introduce our speaker, I'd like to cover a couple of housekeeping items. Uh, first, if you have a question during the presentation, please submit it using your webinar toolbar. Um, we will go ahead and answer the questions at the end of the presentation. However, I do like to you know, go ahead and offer you the chance to submit your questions throughout the presentation in case you think of something. I don't want you to forget them at the end. And then one hour after the presentation ends, you will receive a survey. If you complete the survey, there will be a link to download the PDF of the presentation slides. And finally, I'm recording today's presentation, so you will receive an email once the recording has been posted to CAPS's website and the YouTube channel. So if there, it's a great way, you know, you have both the PDF slides, you have the webinar recording, uh, you know, replay it or watch it on demand or share it with those who maybe weren't able to make the live presentation. Um, I'd now like to introduce our speaker, Mark Friend. Mark is the general manager for Ameriplate and has worked for the past three and a half decades, both domestically and internationally. His work encompasses many countries and aspects of business and industries throughout Mexico, Africa, South Africa, and the Philippines. Mark has invested his life and career in developing businesses, leaders, and products. He's passionate about quality and desires to add value in all he does. So we're very excited to have him with us today and to be sponsoring our presentation as well. So without further ado, I would now like to turn the presentation over to Mark Friend. Thank you, Carly, and good morning, everyone. And I want to welcome you as well to this morning's webinar. Energizing your world with electroplating was chosen because it simply uh, put all of us have some type of a product or some type of a device that affects our life that has electroplated parts. I'd like to thank our good friends at CBSA for making this webinar possible through the hard work and their dedication that all of them have, we're able to enjoy the benefits of this collaboration. And whether it's just the seminar, obtaining greater understanding of the market, even trends, they've helped us understand some of the trends that are taking place as we ride this roller coaster of business. We've been able to take advantage of the research and marketing tools. And they've answered a lot of questions that I've had, and I'm very thankful for that, and the team there at CBSA. And I want to say thanks again, and I would also like to thank our good friends at ABC, which has sponsored many of these seminars that um, we've been able to watch together. And so first and foremost, I hope to complete this seminar before you're finished. So please keep your fingers away from the off button. We'll try to get through this and make it exciting, and hopefully you'll be able to learn something that will help you and your customer as well as boost your sales. I'd also like to thank those that have been a part of this throughout the presentation process of building everything from the slides to what we're going to talk about today. Excuse me, electroplating affects all of our lives. Um, it, like I said, touches us because of the components anymore that all of us use, whether it be a computer, electronics, appliances, our car. Some of the methods that we use in electroplating will be discussed so that hopefully you'll have a better understanding of how electroplating is done or performed, and I know we've had a lot of questions of individuals that use a mirror plate as their premier plater, just the process involved so that they can speak to their customer. And so we're going to be covering some of that, and also we'll be covering quality and what we can do as a provider or as a plater or as a salesperson to make sure that what we provide to the end user they're very happy with. And I want to begin with this process now and we'll go with the first screen. Electroplating 101 is basically the basics of electroplating. It starts with a basic cell. The cell consists of a negative charged cathode and that's the part to be plated and I'll have pictures in just a moment. A positive charge and that's the anode. You would need a DC power supply which is going to be a rectifier that changes the flow of electric from AC to DC, you would need tanks to hold your solution, and then you'll have the electrolytes, which is the actual solution that will carry current. Now, some of this will be as exciting as pulling teeth, but I think in a minute you'll understand why I've covered some of these things. 
in this slide is the cathode, which would be possibly some of the material that you would send to a plater or would have to be plated. What we'll cover today is going to be a reel-to-reel -reel process. There's also different types of plating, which is barrel plating, which would be parts. But what we do at Ameriplate is reel-to-reel, -reel, and that's what I'll concentrate on, which simply means that it comes in, as you can see in this picture, on reels, goes through the plating process, and then at take-up, it is taken up as a reel and then sent out for whatever the purpose would be, either of stamping or what the end supplier would be. The cathode is going to be any object to be plated, and objects must have the ability to carry current. So that means it's got to be some type of a metal or copper or brass. You can plate plastics, but that's a special process that we won't get into today. And normally, their metallic objects are most commonly electroplated. And uh, like I stated, plastics have to have a special current that you would use for that. The anode is going to be the positively charged side of the circuit. The anodes can be inert or consumable, and I'll have a picture of those in a moment as well. Consumable anodes, generally made of the same material that is being plated, which would be what we'll cover today is nickel, copper, or tin. And they're placed in an anode basket that what takes place is these anodes are charged with a current. As the current flows through the anodes and through your solution, it's electrically plated onto the cathode, which is going to be possibly your material. And so you can see on the left, we have 3 quarter inch copper balls, the nickel, and then you've got the 3 quarter inch tin balls. There are a variety of types of plating that I'm sure that most of you have seen, and one of which is gold plating. Gold plating is a lot in electrical connectors and circuit boards, computers, and high-end electronics. Gold plating is often used in electronics for the purpose of being able to have a, a better non-corrosive, and like I said, they come in the high-end electronics. For instance, you can get connectors and things like that for speakers that are gold plated. And what it does, it provides a corrosion resistance so that when you plug in that plug, whether it be in a speaker or some type of a uh, electronic device, it has a better connection, which if it was a speaker would give you better sound or a better supply of electric or sound waves to your speaker. It is conductive with layers of gold on top of copper, which is also corrosive resistant metals. Then there's zinc plating. Zinc plating will prevent oxidation, and that's a real issue, especially in the electrical side of plating, because if you have corrosion obvious, you then have bad connections. This happens a lot in cars, especially in salty areas or areas where there's a lot of maybe around the sea or the ocean where there's salt water, or in the north where we have a lot of salt on the roads. It gives us a lot of issues with any type of corrosive matters that would go to our connections, whether it be wire harnesses or any type of connections in your batteries or in your engine. So what zinc plating will do will prevent the oxidation of those metals and will give that coating or a barrier that will act also as a sacrificial anode if this barrier is damaged. Now you'll see this sometimes on boats. Boats that sit in slips will have a sacrificial anode. So if there's any currents that go through water, it would be attracted to that zinc anode uh, to protect your boat. It would also be in hot water tanks so that if there's corrosive uh, matter in the water, they would go to the sacrificial anode and destroy the anode before it would destroy your hot water tank. So that's used for that type of plating for zinc and those protect measures. There's rhodium plating, and rhodium plating is approximately 80% of the world's production in rhodium is in the catalytic converters in automobiles. And those catalytic converters are very expensive because of this type of plating. And there's some catalytic converters that also use gold plating. But the catalytic converter converts the uh, problems in the atmosphere that a motor would transmit or go back into the atmosphere. 
So we're being able to environmentally protect our atmosphere through rodent plating devices. And every car has this. Then there's silver plating. Silver plating, as we've all seen in silverware or our cutlery, knives, forks, candlesticks, more often than not, they're silver plated on the lower end valued items. There are obvious higher end value that are pure silver. But for the past several centuries, silver plating has been used to protect items and to give us things that, that look very nice. And that's why you have to polish it, because silver will oxidize or have that grayish color that you have to clean. And it's used, as it says, as a variety of household items, jewelry, bowls, drinking glasses. So I'm sure maybe there may be things in your home that you have that are silver plated. Silver plating is also used in circuit boards. You'll see this a lot also in computers and other electronic devices. And these are, again, corrosive resistant, gives a better conduit for your electric current, and it helps with all the other connections that are in that computer so that you've got a good processor or a good computer. We do a lot of tin plating here at Ameriplate. It's our primary plating, and this is widely used also in electronics. Tin will protect the base metal from oxidation as the other metals, as we talked about, even with zinc. And it preserves the solderability, one of the things that we have to do when we do our test for our plated material is a solderability test to make sure that the solder is able to adhere to that tin so that if in the weld of the end product they, do, they don't have a problem with oxidation or they don't have a problem with weld or corrosion because there's nothing worse than having something that you paid for that doesn't have a good weld and doesn't work properly. So the end user and quality is a very, very important thing I know in my mind and my heart as we work through manufacturing. There are also a variety of types of plating, which is tin lead plating. In electronic application, lead may be added to improve solderability and to prevent the growth of metallic whiskers in compression st stress deposits, which would otherwise cause electrical shorting. And these whiskers are exactly what it is. There's just a real fine micro size whisker that begins to grow on that organic or that, that, that tin and would cause a problem with corrosion, a connecting uh, ability, that, that whisker would break the connection. And so when you add a small part of lead to your tin, you're able to re prevent, I should say, excuse me, prevent those whiskers. And at Ameriplate, we use a 90-10 bath, which is 90% tin and 10% lead. Now, in other baths, there's 60-40. So you can get a variety of types of baths with lead, lead excuse me, that would be able to give you whatever connectability that you would need for that plating. Cadmium plating. That's an interesting thing because this type of plating is under scrutiny because of the danger of the environment. And so as we talked about with catalytic converters, you've got a plating process here that also will affect the environment. And cad cadmium metal has an environmental toxicity, yet this plating is still widely used in some applications, such as aerospace fasteners, which would need to be at high pressure or in high intense heat. And the military uses this, and avionics uses it as well. Though it's being phased out because of the situation with our environment, it's still part of what we do in the plating industry. We do not do it at Ameriplate, but it is still a viable part in plating. Nickel plating. Nickel is, as you would know, what's in your pocket. Now, that's not going to be pure nickel that you have in that nickel that you would spend. But it's also going to be plated and have a different part of other alloys in that because of the softness of nickel. And nickel is used as an underplate or a flash. And what this does, it gives the metal or the alloy that you're plating an underplate before you put tin 
so that it would adhere better to things like steel, stainless steel, and at times it's placed on copper or as well as brass. As we go through this, I try to make it just a little bit exciting because I grew up in southern Ohio, and you probably can hear a little bit of twang. And growing up in Ohio, I grew up in a little city called Fairfield. We were known as the Fairfield Farmers. And I'll never forget hearing the story of the older gentleman that went in and to town for the first time, took his family. And as he rode into town, he wanted to see the new hotel that they had put in. And a lot like a hotel, plating kind of gives you the newness of a variety of things. And as he walked into the hotel, he stood there and watched a certain contraption that would open and then close. A group would come up, push a button, a door would open, they would walk in. He'd wait a moment, the door would close, the door would open, and a whole new group of people would come in or out. And he stood there and he watched an older individual walk in and she was very stately dressed and the support of her cane. She stepped into this contraption, the door closed, then the door opened and out stepped this wonderfully dressed younger lady. And he was amazed. He'd never seen anything like this. And he stood there again and watched it and another older lady walked in. Then the door opens back up and out steps another well-dressed younger lady. And as he stood there with his son, without moving his eyes from this contraption, he simply said, son, go get your mother. He wanted something to change pretty quick, and that's what electroplating does. It changes the application of one alloy so that you can use it for another alloy. And there's a variety of plating in copper as well. A mirror plate will often use copper as an underplate, or we will use it as an overplate, and I'll have pictures of that in just a moment for you. Underplating is used in accordance with the ASTM standards, which is going to be the international standards that we all use in the automotive industry so that there's a standard that everybody is working with. And underplate is used to prevent, again, zinc migration and impairment of solderability during service or storage. It helps with the substrates of brass or copper alloys, and it keeps that zinc from being able to come back through from your alloy back through into your tin. And you can either use nickel or copper as an underplating. And so as you begin to go through different steps and procedures, as you possibly are trying to make sales or you're trying to see some new product that you could add to your line, you'll be able to see that plating products and certain aspects of plating can really change a variety of things that you're able to sell. Now in the plating process itself, we talked about the rectifier. And the rectifier will convert AC to DC. And the machine that converts this is called the rectifier. It's referred to a power supply. And all electric plating processes use DC power. And generally, not always, but generally, electroplating uses lower voltage and high amperage. And this voltage ranges from 0 through 12 VDC amperes for small applications, and less than 1 amp at times is used. And that will determine the thickness or the amount of plating that you put on your substrate. Large applications can be over 10,000 amps. And here at Ameriplate, we use ranges from 50 to 1,000 amps. And again, the amount of current that's going through that and by being provided by this rectifier into your solution will determine as well of how thick of the material or how thick of the plating that's going onto the alloy. And you can see on the front of this particular rectifier on the left-hand side is the current, and on the right-hand side is the amp selector, which then you're able to adjust this machine to determine the amount of current that will be going through your anodes and your cathodes. The tanks that are used for the solution are here at Ameriplate, we use PVC. Polypropylene can also be used as well as stainless steel. And you've got to be careful with your plates because if you're using a material that can be plated, you'll be plating your 
container or your bath will be going into your container and being plated to the sides and so that's why we use PVC. Rubber and lead line tanks are also used and what this will do is it'll cause the electrolytes uh, not to attach themselves or to plate the sides of your tank. The electrolytes is the solution. What you have is a solution that contains metals that are going to be plated onto the surface of the cathode. So if you're using tin, there's going to be tin electrolytes. If you're going to be using copper, nickel, there's going to be those electrolytes in that solution. Here at Ameriplate, we plate tin, tin lead, and nickel, and copper. Now tin is plated from a sulfamate-based solution. It's dissolved in the sulfuric acid and then forms this stannous sulfate. And what that does, it's creating the tin to be in a solution going through the three-quarter inch tin balls that we had shown before, dissolving those tin balls, and then it is plated to the sides of that alloy. Tin lead alloy plating is plated from an acid-based solution. And this is another aspect of plating that you're not just concerned about what material or what type of alloy you're plating, but you've got to be very concerned about your solutions and your chemistry, that they're all balanced, they have the right heat, they have the right consistency, and that all of these acids and solutions are properly based for what you're going to be doing on that alloy. And this is used because lead will not stay in the solution if there's sulfur present. So there's an MSA acid that you use when you're applying lead to this as well. The lead from lead sulfate drops out of the solution in a white, very messy goo. And using these slides for our presentation today, as well as in other training that we do, you cannot mix sulfate tin solution with MSA solution. And I say this because there's some maybe that are out there that, that do some plating, and maybe you've had some problems. Uh, I know that some of the issues that we face in Ameriplate, I'm able to call people and say, hey, I'm, I'm having this problem or issue. Are you able to help me? And so I state that because there's a goo, there's a mess, there's a residual that's left over that you've got to make sure is taken care of if you're a plater. Now, the electrolytes that we spoke of, one of which is nickel. It's plated out of nickel sulfamate, the solution that contains the nickel chloride. Nickel's very expensive, so you've got to watch for that drag out or so that it doesn't come from the bath or the solution into a drain. And nickel sulfamate is also a boric acid base. Copper is plated out of copper sulfate solution. And cop copper sulfate is very aggressive. It'll attack, it'll corrode steel and stainless steel. You have to be very cautious if you're plating this type of a alloy. And you've got to make sure that your solution, again, stays in your tank, that there's no drag out, that it's not mixing with your other acids or with your other cleaners or with your other activators. And all of the electrolytes used in a mayor plate have some type of organic added to them to change or to enhance the deposit, which would be brighteners, which would be organics that would help the flow of that tin to go onto that material. There's also one other application that we have here, which is called reflow, and that you plate the alloy with a matte tin, then you take it through a reflow oven that raises it to 450 degrees, literally melting that tin back over the alloy. So you have a reflow oven and a reflow look. This is also used in electronics. Now this slide is one of the slides that I chose because it's giving you a surface look at 100 times magnification of plated material. It helps you see any imperfections or what would cause any imperfections that would lead to problems in the future, whether it be in solderability, corrosion, and I want to speak about this later when it comes to quality because a lot of things that we do in the plating industry has direct results on many, many end users. And yet 
the material that arrives at any shop comes from some place that needs to high, have a high standard of quality as well. And so as we look at quality and as we examine a plated part, as you look under the microscope, as you're trying to determine the quality of plating or the quality of the surface, um, quality is a very important thing that I'm, I'm, like it was said in my bio, I've committed my life to. I, I know you're like me, that you want the best item that you can get at the best price. And I think that it would be great if we could somehow renew and revitalize the quality that we're presenting to the end user. And now on this slide, you're going to see the same surface, but at 100 magnification with a different amount of tin applied. And this is what actually looks like once the material has been plated. Now, when you look at this, it looks uneven, but it has the sense of the touch of very smooth. So though it may be smooth, you have a very uneven plated material that would cause openness and pores that could cause corrosion. So you've got to make sure that your tin solution and all that you're doing has a high quality and a high standard where that you do not have porous material that's able to corrode. And that's the reason why you can see on the slide that we just came from some corrosion that's building up on this particular item. This is a cross section of a thousand times magnification. You'll notice the bottom part is brass. Then you have a small thin layer of copper that's been plated. Then you have a layer of nickel. Then you have a layer of tin. These cross sections can be used in examining thickness to determine the value and the quality of the product. You're able to see how the, the flow of tin or nickel or copper is flowing onto that substrate, whether it be brass, steel, stainless steel, or copper. So I showed you this slide so you can see the actual plating of an item, a thousand times magnification, but it helps you see how that when you're plating, you're plating into the millionths of an inch. So you're measuring from the decimal point six points over to the right. So when you are calling in a item that you'd like to have 100 micro inches, that's 100 millionths of an inch. So you're not talking about a lot of plating. And if you're using an ASTM standard at 545, the A, that's requiring 100 micro inches. This particular slide we're looking at, you're looking at copper, nickel, and tin over brass. This is a cross section of 600 times magnification. You're plating on top of copper with a copper silver, then another layer of copper. So this is an actual plated item that you're seeing the two layers of copper silver, then copper. And the reason for this particular item is you're trying to preserve the copper silver, which is a soft material. You'll place copper over top of that so that you preserve the softer material so that if there's bendability or if there's pressure or some type, some type of application that the copper needs to protect that silver. Quality is defined in several ways in several people's minds. The definition of quality is a high level of value or excellence. Working together as whether you're a provider or whomever's listening today, I would encourage all of us to work together for a higher level of excellence, a higher level of quality. I know that we as Americans and we as industrialists and we as people that crisscross, and not just Americans, there's others that will be listening to this from other countries, that we have a strong desire, I know at Ameriplate, to better our quality. I want to encourage us today just Put a new expectancy inside of us. What can we do better? How can we better the process so that the end user, the consumer, is better protected, 
better taken care of, and better situations in life because we've done our job. And it's the desire of us all to involve not just luck when it comes to quality. Luck isn't quality. Hoping something turns out right, that, that doesn't work. And I think today as a presenter, I just want to say, let's work toward a higher quality of living for the end user, a higher quality of product for each other, because what comes to me and the quality of what I have to plate, and then my quality is going to go to the next person who's got to apply their application or stamper, or whether it be someone that uses the other reason or item, that together we can help each other make a quality decision, of not just depending on luck, but depending on the quality that we all put into it. And it's been said, you, you cannot inspect quality into a product. It must be done right. It's pretty interesting. I'm building a house, and one of the gentlemen said, you know, we do it right because we do it twice. And I don't think that's the best way to do things. I think if you can get it right the first time, you've got a lot better product and a lot better chance of increasing the value of your company as well as your sales. And we've learned from a variety of individuals, but especially I really enjoy watching the our Japanese counterparts as they begin to evaluate. And I know that they've caused us to look at quality in a different way. And one of the things that they say is prevention, not detection, is the proper way to run a business. So I don't want to find out something didn't have the level of quality that I expected after the fact. I want to inspect it and put the level of quality into it before production. So as we close out today, I want to say thank you very much for allowing me to take the time of your time and take the time of others to help put all of this together. I hope you've learned something. I hope that it's been able to be profitable to you. If there's any questions or anything that I can be a part of or assist you in, I'm more than ready to help as a team member as we begin to produce and begin to do the quality work that all of us would like to do. So I'd like to turn this back over to Carly and say thank you very much, Carly, for your help and your assistance and all that we have. Thank you. Thank you, Mark. I, that was a great presentation. I appreciate it. Like Mark said, if you have any questions for him, please go ahead and um, type those into the toolbar for you um, so we can get those answered for you. Mark, I have a question, um, and it might depend on the various types of plating, but typically what is the timeline for the plating process? From the time that the material arrives? Right. Okay. Well, right now we're able to do about a week turnaround time. It obviously depends on the amount of material that we have. But um, about a week turnaround time from when we receive the material. Now we've had you know, customers that call in and ask us if we can turn it around quicker, and we have been able to. There's times it arrives here first thing in the morning, and it's shipping out that afternoon. So it really depends on the size of the item, size of the um, uh, order, as well as when it arrives. Okay. Well, thank you very much again, Mark, for presenting for us today and for Ameriplate sponsoring our presentation. Um, like I told everyone at the beginning, you will get a survey here in an hour. Um, if you will, please go ahead and complete that survey for us. It helps us determine topics for um, you know, future webinars. and. Uh, you know, great feedback for us, um, and you'll also get the slides, a copy of the slides. So Mark has his contact information up here. I know sometimes it's um, you know a little intimidating to ask questions on the call. So if you think of anything, you know, afterward, and you want to reach out to Mark, feel free to go ahead and do that. Um, he's got his email and phone up here, um, willing to help in any way he can. So Mark, thank you very much. Thank you everyone for being on the call with us today. Um, and keep uh, your email and look out for your email inbox, and I'll get an email out to everyone when uh, the recording is up and available. So, um, otherwise, until next time, thank you all. Have a great weekend, and goodbye.